You're listening to the Empowered Equestrian Podcast. So when I say athlete, what immediately pops into your mind? Well, that's what we're going to dive into in this episode with my friend Andrea Parker, an amazing nutritionist and the owner at the Equestrian Athlete. What are the norms around being an athlete and what can you do to better fuel and support your journey as an equestrian? Well, you're going to find out, so stay tuned. Hi, I'm Teal Shoup, and you're about to empower your equestrian life with this podcast. I'm an adult amateur rider, the CEO of global innovator Sterling Essentials, and I'm passionate about loving horses and being an equestrian on my own terms. If you're a wanting more rider but thinks our equestrian world can be better, is curious, is a little frustrated with the conventions of the equestrian industry, this podcast is for you. If you're looking for what empowers and builds you up as an equestrian rather than tears you down, this podcast is for you. Journey with me and my guests from all walks of equestrian life to hear the conversations, wisdom, and stories that will help you become an empowered equestrian. And when you're in an empowered equestrian, you become present in even more meaningful ways to yourself, your horse, and your equestrian community. And then together, we will help our equestrian community thrive. I'm glad you're here. So we are back. This is our another fabulous episode. And I'm so excited to have my good friend, Andrew Parker, with me here. And we're going to chit chat today about, oh, so many, so many wonderful, wonderful things. And um, of course, I think I've mentioned before, she's coming to us all the way from Australia. So we are chatting in my afternoon and her morning on two different days and having um, the fun with time zones today. So welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Teal. I'm really (laughs) excited to be here chatting to you. Of course, of course. So um, gosh, you know, I'm sure a lot of uh, folks who have followed me might have seen you go by. Of course, they might be familiar with you as the wonderful sand arena ballerina but you've also got uh something a little bit new going on right do you want to tell us a little bit about what you've been up to yeah so at the end of last year i made the decision to um launch out on my own into the world of private practice as a dietitian um so i've been a dietitian for nine years now um but working for the government and I sort of decided to get yeah, launch into the world of private practice as a way of um, making a little bit of extra money to, <laughs> to pay for the ponies. <laughs> um, and I'm currently studying my sports dietitian, or doing my training to become a registered sports dietitian, which I am so, so excited about. Wow, that sounds just like very big very big and intense like lots of of studying and deep diving and and quite serious yeah it um the training has been pretty full-on um it's only 13 weeks which is good um yeah but I I'm a little bit of a nerd at heart so I (laughs) love getting down into into all that stuff and I actually just really love learning that's awesome. That's see, me yeah. too. I'm like, I'm, I could be in school for forever if maybe I didn't have to take any more tests. <laughs> if you didn't have to take classes. and if, Or the tests, you know, any more exams. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I could just sit there all day and be like, yep, yeah, okay. So that's so fun. Cool. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is so cool though. Cause um, yeah, you've been in this vein for a while, but it's really, I think, paired so closely right with your equestrian background and and so I mean remind me you started in like all kinds of other disciplines before you moved into now more dressage right yeah yeah so I might go back to the start um so I am pretty lucky that I have a mum who is horsey as well um she rode growing up and then sort of stopped when she left home to become an adult Um, as so many of us have to do. It happens. Um, Yeah, it really does, doesn't it? Um, So I started taking riding lessons and mum got back into horses at the same time. I was about eight or nine and um, we lived up in Darwin, which is sort of in the top middle of Australia. Um, And that was such a fun place to 
to live and to to ride um and by the time I was 10 I had my first pony um and so I guess I've I've been riding for quite a a while now I'm um 32 um and I have been really fortunate to not have any breaks but yes when I was younger I did I kind of did pony club and so I did a bit of everything from you know eventing to the gym gymkhanas where you do like the um, barrel racing and yeah. bending and all I wasn't good at it I <laughs> rode it like a dressage rider um <laughs> and you know we have polo cross here which is like kind of like polo but with a stick with a net on the end of it right um, I even did a bit of um like camp drafting and wow. like tried it rather than competed in it but uh-huh. yeah I, oh, I did a bit cool. of, yeah did a bit of everything I was never really brave enough to be a successful show jumper or cross-country <laughs> rider um, and when I was in uni I, I had the really fortunate experience to be able to ride one of my coach's horses while she was away on her honeymoon or two of them actually one was her Grand Prix stallion oh, wow. um and the other was one of her mares who was sort of at advanced or which I think for you guys is like fourth level mm. um and that just gave me a taste of some of those higher level movements and <laughs> that was it I was hooked I knew that's what I wanted to pursue um and so ever since then I've just been doing dressage I occasionally do like a little bit of you know a jump over a cross rail or whatever just for something different sure um yeah just, I'm a... just spice it up <laughs> yeah exactly yeah <laughs> and I'm also really lucky so even though I live in Brisbane um which is the capital city of Queensland we've got heaps of really beautiful bushland reserves around where we keep horses uh, so I try and get out there pretty regularly oh. as I think it's so good for their brains just to be able to switch off from the arena. Oh my gosh. Yeah, for sure. And that just sounds lovely that there's so much available for you to get to. And I mean, fairly easily. I mean, I know Australia is a big place and it can take a while to get to anywhere. Um, (laughs) But that's really neat that that's all available and in such a condition that you're kind of out and away. And yeah, that little mental, little mental break too then, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Well, this is really cool because um, I love then how you brought your career, you know, into this where, you know, you have this idea about, I've heard you talk about, um, you know, equestrians at, as athletes and and how, well, of course, now that's the name of your amazing new empire, right? <laughs> um, so fitting, but I, I just love that you brought this topic up into the community now. And how does this tie into kind of your mission and, and what does that really mean? Equestrians as athletes to you. Yeah. So I think that um, I actually had a little bit of a shock last weekend. I was asking some questions on my Instagram and I realized there's actually a lot of writers out there who aren't considering themselves to be athletes. And that probably shouldn't have been a shock, but I guess I've kind of been in that headspace for a sure. while now where I'm like, no, nope, we're athletes. We need to, look after ourselves as athletes um yeah but it it did come as a little bit of a shock to me but anyway um, (laughs) yeah I don't think people even think about that like I mean I even I do but I but I don't you know I don't maybe put the term athlete with it even though I think I'm like be healthy be fit work out perform but somehow those two words don't come together in like common parlance yeah and I guess I think there's a couple of things going on there that that one we kind of maybe see athletes as being people who do extremely physically demanding sports like say endurance athletes or um, track and field athletes but I kind of think an athlete is anyone who does anything that's in any way physical and they do it with intention and purpose Mm. so that's that's really the philosophy that underpins the equestrian athlete Mm. for me um I love that I love that like intention yeah like you you it's not just you went for a walk around the block makes you an athlete but rah rah you that you went for a walk around the block but intention that's I think that's super important because riders are really intentional 
Exactly. Exactly. You know, most of us go out there with a plan of like, okay, today I'm going to be working on shoulder in, or I'm going to be working mm-hmm. on a related line in jumping. Um, you know, we, we mostly have goals that we're trying to achieve. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't think that has to be in a competitive sense either. Like maybe it's that you want to build up to trail riding on your own, or you want to go for half an hour or something like those things are athletic pursuits as well. It's just not what we've traditionally been told that an athlete is. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that makes a ton of sense. Cause yeah, I think, um, well, even amateur riders, I mean, like myself, I'm not a pro and, and I don't really compete. I've done a tiny bit and I'm, I mean, I'm not now at the moment and just there's sort of, a cultural norm around oh athlete means competition athlete means your your hair's on fire and if you don't win you're like ah you know like you're you're so motivated in that way and I'm like no like you can still be so in it right if you're if you're if you're just more for like fun you know not with all maybe the other collective baggage is not the right word but (laughs) You know what I'm trying to say? Like there's there's so much that goes with being really competitive that can um sometimes get in the way of fun. Whole other topic, I digress. Mm-hmm. But um yeah. yeah, I think that's so important because like why can't the person that trail rides think of themselves in this amazing light as an athlete and then put that yeah. that hat on? Like that feels so powerful. Yeah, yeah, it does, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I think, yes, the the types of things that you're working on from a nutrition point of view are going to be very different with someone who trail rides versus someone who's riding, you know, eight horses a day. But mm-hmm. that doesn't take away from that identity as an athlete. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So let's go there a little bit, you know, like with the, the nutrition topic, because, you know, this is this is near and dear to your heart with Mm. like that's a cultural norm right that that oh you know nutrition is for these high performing super powerful elite pro going to the olympics athletes like uh well what about everybody else yeah yep um and you know i think uh the I guess there's there's a couple of different things in Mm -hmm. there in terms of nutrition, but um, I think that one, the culture that we have around food in equestrian sports is, hasn't always been the most productive. Mm -hmm. Um, So I kind of think that it's been really normal to go, yeah, well, you know, I, I analyze what I feed my horse to the nth degree and um, everything is perfectly planned out and they get this at this time and this at this time and we don't deviate from that at all. Um, And I'm not saying that's necessarily how we should be feeding ourselves because um, I'm all about balance and flexibility. But, you know, we would do that. And then on the other hand, we'll go, well, actually, I haven't got time, so I'm just going to drive through McDonald's. Right a fine choice to be making sometimes but if we're doing that all of the time it's probably not going to actually leave us feeling the best Mm -hmm. so for me part of what I am trying to do is about not necessarily putting ourselves before our horse because as as sorry as equestrians you know it's always putting our horse first but I think we need to bring ourselves up to the same level Mm -hmm. as our horse and I think that's quite a challenging mind mindset shift for a lot of people um and so if that is something that challenges you that idea of treating yourself as well as you treat your horse then maybe even thinking about it as well if there's no other reason if I am looking after myself as well as I look after my horse I'm making their job easier because they're carrying me Mm -hmm. oh that's yeah that's a great point that's a great point and uh, I mean have you seen other things too, where I just think about um, when you eat well, like, do you then feel well? And even in the mental space, how does that 
mental space translate into your ride even if like yeah. aside from like your what your body is doing but just the yeah yeah you know what I mean that's probably a trickier one to answer because mm. I don't like I don't know that we have the research to kind of sure. demonstrate that but I think you know generally if we're eating enough and we're eating in a fairly balanced way mm. that's going to make our energy levels better and if our energy levels are good then we can be more present and concentrate better on our writing um I think probably the the flip side to that is there's a lot of pressure in equestrian sports to to look this certain way and I think mm. um that that very much mirrors what is considered the ideal body in society so white tall thin right yeah and we know that that's not what makes a great rider like sure. if you look at the olympics there are so many different body shapes and sizes um although it probably does still skew a bit to people who are thinner um mm -hmm. but I, I don't think that you need to be thin to be a good rider yeah. um but I think that pressure to look that way results in oftentimes people being really restrictive with what they're eating okay. and not necessarily eating enough. And when you're in that state of not having enough energy, you tend to be really hyper-focused on food and eating, mm. which then takes away that mental energy that could be put into your writing. I never thought of that, that then you're, what is it sort of like the it's the lack so because you have the lack like it just is like screaming at you all the time that like I'm hungry or my body is trying to tell me I need something and it's just taking that awareness and hijacking exactly. it huh. exactly yeah so it's like a survival mechanism really sure Our body's trying to keep us alive and it wants food <laughs> and then we're trying to override that mm -hmm. um with our, our brains are trying to override our biology sure. um our biology is always gonna win yeah and it's like we set up uh for if i'm so what i hear you saying is like we're setting up almost like this little internal war with ourselves like we're doing like this this costly battle just with our ourselves and it's sort of no one else did it to us but ourselves. <laughs> exactly right yeah oh. and, and i guess you know, while that might be a decision that we're making as an individual, mm -hmm. it kind of sits in that broader context of what's happening sure. in the culture. So yeah. I think we don't, we don't ever make decisions in isolation. So I'm certainly not blaming people who have gone down that pathway. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's common and it's understandable that people want to kind of fit in and, and feel like they belong. Oh, um, but I think that's where we as a as a community can actually start to fight back and to kind of challenge those cultural norms yeah well I mean I mean the awareness I think is where it all begins right um definitely with so many things with so many things and that's why I think it's interesting is like uh if 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 you're a person if you're a writer that maybe is is making some of these decisions and of course whatever all in your power you have the choices and right to make mm. all those choices for yourself and you should and kudos to them and to all of our listeners but I just think it's interesting because then with the information you can sit back and say oh I see maybe where I'm having a little tension right now on this topic of nutrition maybe I can look a little deeper maybe there's a question I can ask and what bubbles up then to the surface and what should I do about it? You know, I think that's so cool. I think this is so cool that you're then kind of bringing this to light for people to see. Yeah. 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 And I suppose I, I feel super lucky um, to be in a position to be able to do this. It, it's something that I've, you know, that seed of an idea has been there for mm -hmm. me to do this work for a long time. I just wasn't actually sure if it would take off. And so a couple of years ago, I through Instagram, the the wonderful connections we make through Instagram, right? That's yes, right. <laughs> um, met Natalie, Natalie Gabby, um, who is the equestrian dietitian, and 
she's based in the US and a significant portion of her practice is working with equestrians. Yeah, no, I think that's so cool. Like the little connections and then you're like, oh, these fabulous ideas come to light. And I mean, well, and I mean, I'm thinking too, you know, with nutrition, what has been the story then like of your life and how has that helped you maybe shape your narrative for your your clients and what you can help advise on? Yeah, um, so I, my mom is a nurse and I okay. guess has always been quite health conscious. Mm -hmm. uh, so we grew up with a fairly, like a fairly healthy way of eating. Um, and I guess you know, for, for me, my story with nutrition is kind of um, contextualized by the fact that I am white, tall, thin, mm -hmm. able body. Um, I, I do have an enormous amount of privilege in that space. Um, and I, I guess um, probably the, the thing that stands out for me is um, the, the only real challenge I've had is that I, I have gone through a couple of periods in my adult life where for various reasons I've gained weight and that has really set up some challenges for me around my body image. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it probably came at the same time as I started to learn more about this framework or approach called health at every size, um, okay. which is something that I'm super invested in in my work as a dietitian. So it's essentially this idea that everyone, well, it's, it's more than an idea, it's a philosophy, mm. uh, that everyone has the, the right to be able to pursue health regardless of the size that their, their body is. Mm -hmm. um, and that no one is obligated to lose weight and tied in really closely with that is also we have a lot of research that shows that actually weight isn't the best predictor of our health outcomes. It's actually our health behaviours. So things like the foods that we eat, mm -hmm. um, being physically active, getting enough sleep, not smoking, drinking in moderation, all of those <laughs> sorts of things. So uh, the, the no. habits more than the, the number, it's the habits. Exactly. Let me think I hear. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Okay. And then, you know, then there's also a bunch of other things like our genetic predisposition mm -hmm. for certain conditions. Um, the environment that we live in has a really, really strong impact on our health. You know, if yeah. you live in a neighborhood where you don't feel safe to go out and exercise after hours then that's right. going to have a really big impact or you don't even have places where you can go and exercise like maybe there aren't any bike paths or walkways in your neighborhood right or the quality of the the stores that are available you know as the corner store if you're in an urban community do you have access to the good fresh produce like yeah what do you have at your fingertips what's convenient yeah. safe and easy and affordable yeah, exactly. Exactly yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's such an interesting question. And I mean, I know it, it has um, so much in the community, even beyond the equestrian world. And I mean, the equestrian world is already, for the most part, very much one of privilege. Um, and yeah. so to some degree, there are a lot of folks out there that have access to all of the the resources, the exercise situations, the, the, the nutrition, the grocery stores, like all of those things. And maybe then it's just uh, the education part that has to come into play. Yeah, definitely. And then yeah. I think also this um, breaking away from the perception that we need to be a certain shape mm -hmm. or size to yeah. ride. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was just out at, um, so <laughs> full disclosure, I'm a little tired. I was out at the, um, my first horse show that I've gone to in 20 months or whatever it is. And I mean, I didn't, I wasn't riding or competing. I just went out to do a photo shoot and yeah. it was hot today. And I was out there for about three hours or so. And I didn't drink all my water bottle. And so I'm like, okay, I'm a little tired now. I'm, a, I got a little dehydrated. I've been drinking water and my tea all afternoon, but I'm like, I'm lethargic. Right. Yeah. And I'm just thinking then about all of those competitors out there 
today and like all weekend and the same with you know horse shows everywhere around the world it's that thing of like how to take care of yourself to be there and present for your partner I mean they're going through all the same things with the heat and they need their water and electrolytes you're taking care of your horse but like are you fueling yourself well at the horse show? Are we over at like the greasy chili cheese fries and then we're hot and we're heavy on that. And then we had a, a Coke and we didn't have the water and now we're all sugared up. Like, I think there's just like a conversation to happen also with that kind of culture we even see in these equestrian environments. Exactly. I think, um, you know, what you were saying about hydration is so mm-hmm. common, like, I think we can all think back to a time where we've (laughs) two o'clock and we've been out with our horse all day doing Mm -hmm. whatever we've been doing. And all of a sudden you're like, Oh, I've only peed once today. Right. Yeah. That's healthy. Uh Oh, (laughs) And, and the thing with dehydration is it impacts on our brain's ability to work our, you know, concentration, our, ability to react um so that you know that has really significant impacts on our riding then like we need to be concentrating we need to be able to react to what our horse is doing or what's happening in the environment around us so um I think hydration is a really really big thing for riders yeah especially when you look at what we wear at competitions because (laughs) we're really impacting on our body's ability to cool down because the sweat needs to be able to um to evaporate and if we've got clothing on top of that that's affecting that there's not the convective airflow to keep us cool exactly and um yeah i i even think back to a post that i saw on a dressage page the other day sorry this is probably a slight um detour we love detours (laughs) (laughs) um people talking about whether or not you should wear a coat when coats have been waved at a competition. Ah, oh, yes. And so many people were just like, no, nah, I would never not wear a coat at a competition. Huh. One, I feel like I would look silly. And two, my trainer would kill me. And I'm like, <laughs> that's such an interesting mm-hmm. mindset to have around it because it, it really is going to increase your, your, or oh, sorry, impact on your ability to, to regulate your temperature. Right. And that is actually something that could be dangerous. Like yeah. mm-hmm. I, for sure. Heat yeah. stuff, pass out all of that, like yeah. all those things. And it's like, um, is it more important for, you know, riders to look a certain way? and feel like they're not being judged on appearance versus they feel healthy. They feel like they're performing well. They feel comfortable. Um, They're safe. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's just these questions come to my mind and I'm like, there's so much discussion on these, these topics in our industry that are very appearance driven so many things appearance driven and it's just like it's uncomfortable it's hot it's not athletic minded that we are working and being an athlete there's that word again and all of that like I mean I'm like there's so many of those areas and it's just um I feel a lot of times like we're looking at things in the appearance and we're not looking at things from health And it would be really great to have a little bit more of function rather than form. Um, Yeah. Just, yeah. Like how much is that holding us back as a community? Honestly, like that one just blows my mind sometimes. Yeah. And it's like, I get it. Our sport's so, so seeped in tradition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And tradition's what kind of ties in with that. Um, appearance focus Mm -hmm. but yeah at what point can we start to push forward and modernize things where that's going to have an impact on our performance and our health right right 
and then think what we can achieve. I mean, and I don't wonder, you know, for I mean, talking with just riders, like they want to have fun. Like our, uh, folks listening right now, they want to go, you want to go and have fun. This yes. doesn't um, have to be some super rules and, and strict kind of thing. I think uh, just go have fun, feel good about yourself, feel good about your horse and go do it. And I, I know that there's more and more conversation coming on this and we'll continue and that's super exciting. But I, the thing then that I, I, I wonder about is, you know, for, for the equestrians that, well, you can't necessarily go to like mainstream media in the equestrian world to maybe get help on all of these topics. But mm-hmm. if they have the questions, they're wondering, well, gosh, what could I do better to fuel myself to support my horse? How could I take care of myself better in an equestrian minded way for the sport so that I can excel? Like, where do they go? What do they do? Like, I wouldn't even know, you know, like, what would you tell them? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's more people like myself and Natalie kind of um, bringing our expertise and skills to the equestrian community and sort of tailoring it to that group. Um, So I definitely recommend going over and following her and she has a bunch of articles written across different publications around nutrition um there's yeah I mean I can't sort of think of a lot of people off the top of my head but yeah it's um, a pretty small pretty small bucket yeah 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 but hopefully it's going to continue to grow for sure well and I mean and that's the work you're doing too you know yeah that (laughs) that you know you're sticking your in the pond and giving it a right old stir um (laughs) and get the juices flowing on this topic, which I think is truly amazing. And I mean, you know, cause the, the, the everyday rider is as much the lifeblood of the sport as the top athletes and all should be supported and all should be welcome yes. and all should have the resources. And I think that's amazing. Um, cause I mean, you know, like right now I was mentioning, okay, so I'm in the summertime and it's going to be quite warm this week quite quite warm this week but on the flip side you're getting into your winter right and I mean our winter's not that but it's not like that cold right no no so I mean where where like gets below 10 degrees celsius here (laughs) okay all right (laughs) yeah but to like a degree though so like I guess I think about this with, with, you know, climate, like I've got a pretty variable climate. So I feel like my nutrition kind of changes a little bit seasonally. Yeah. Do you feel the same way with you or like, is it kind of pretty even keel? Cause you can get a lot of produce year round or like, what does that look like for you? Yeah. Here in Australia, we like you'll definitely get some fruit and vegetables that will be better at different times of the year. Mm -hmm. Um, But like we, lots of our oranges come from California. Oh, do they? Oh, how fun. (laughs) I think that's one of the interesting things about globalization is like, Uh I don't, I'm not even necessarily super clear on what vegetables are like which season they actually are produced in Mm -hmm. uh, because we do get so much stuff imported. Yeah. Um, But definitely it's common for people in, you know, the middle of summer when it is super hot to to want to eat, um, you know, maybe lighter foods that aren't as hot or heavy. So, you know, avoiding stews and going more for salads Mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and, And really from... A nutrition point of view you can still eat in a balanced way and have those preferences so that's that's totally fine and it comes down to figuring out what works best for your mm-hmm. body and what makes you feel the best yeah oh that's really interesting I mean I just thought of something else then too I don't know if you know the answer I'm just off the top of my head is like does the body then if we tune in kind of self-regulates like it's it, like 
cravings, you know, they're like, oh yeah, we sh- we're really digging like watermelon today or like, you know, having that kind of um, pull from our body to help direct us toward what we need. Is that um, how it works or not so much? I, it's probably not a straightforward answer. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so I guess there, there's an approach called intuitive eating, which is all about tuning into your own hunger and fullness signals and mm-hmm. rejecting the diet mentality mm-hmm. and all of those sorts of things. And if we can get really in tune with those hunger and fullness signals and Mm -hmm. and also what makes us feel good what gives us energy what things maybe don't sit so well um then our body knows how much energy it needs i'm not sure if our bodies will actually be able to say okay i'm i'm low in iron like give me some steak yeah Uh, which is where once you're kind of once you do have a a really peaceful relationship with food Mm -hmm. um, and your body, you can start to incorporate gentle nutrition strategies around, okay, well, having some protein rich foods at each meal is going to be helpful in terms of helping me to feel full and helping to repair my muscles and support muscle Mm. development and those sorts of things. Yeah. Huh. No, that's really interesting. And I, I'm just catching on something you said too, about being at peace with your food and your eating. Um, what a cool concept. Um, I can't say I've ever really processed that before. I've never felt like I'm at war with my food. I mean, I, I feel like I have a very good relationship with my body and my, my eating. Um, but I love that phrase you've just brought up and like, how does that relate then? Because something you've talked about is like this idea of, you know, the diet culture and how much that is just like stinky cheese, no good, you know, well, not this, yeah. stinky cheese is great. I love, you know, smelly cheese, <laughs> but <laughs> when, when you choose to have it, you know right? I mean? <laughs> but that a diet culture is just like, no, thank you. And instead you can have this peaceful relationship that doesn't get into this diet tailspin stuff yes Hmm. yeah and yeah it's um it's something that can take a a a while to get to um particularly if you have had times where you've um you know there's heaps of different things that can um make people want to change the way they're eating um And when you do have that history, it it can take a while to get back in touch with your body and Mm. um, really, you know, not sort of have this dichotomy around good foods and bad foods because all food is fit. And and that's one of my bugbears is, you know, people, I think people see me coming in the office and (laughs) sometimes they're like, oh, the dietician's here, like, she's going to hate me eating this. I'm like, like, I'm I'm the first (laughs) Yeah, I'm the first person to be in line when someone grabs out a cake. Like, I want that cake. Um, <laughs> and and this idea of good and bad foods implies that there is a moral value associated with foods, and there just isn't. It's just food. The yeah. only foods that are bad are foods that you're allergic to, foods that are meant to be cooked and are raw, like chicken. Right. <laughs> um, or foods that are actually spoiled or have gone moldy. Like those are the only bad foods that actually exist. The rest are just, you know, food. It's just energy, right? That's what it all turns yeah. into, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, you know, mm-hmm. again, it kind of comes back to this concept of some of them are going to make us feel better if we're eating them all the time mm. versus, yeah, if you eat ice cream and brownies all day, every day, you're probably not going to feel the best. Oh, no. That's where... <laughs> feel great. <laughs> yeah, that's where listening to your body is really, really mm. helpful. Yeah, no, that's really, really cool. Really cool. It's, uh, yeah, eliminate the good and the bad. It just is. And then choose. Yeah. 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 And for anyone who's kind of in that mindset of thinking about foods as good or bad, Mm. A starting point I often um, 
get people to work on is just really recognize when you are kind of thinking of foods as good and bad and just take notice of that mm. that awareness again huh I guess yeah, yeah. exactly yeah. okay yeah. no that's super cool so what would you then uh suggest to folks you know our fellow riders on first step that they can kind of take to maybe move into a more mindful nutrition space like is there something you would suggest for them just to take a little baby step yeah I mean I think probably if um if you're doing any of that good bad thinking around food Mm -hmm. definitely starting to take notice of that um if you're not um maybe just start to notice how you feel after eating a certain meal like you know um if you have something really heavy do Mm -hmm. you then want to go down and have a nap um versus (laughs) something a little bit lighter but still balanced does it kind of give you the energy to get through the afternoon to to go and have your ride after work or um to do the things that you want to do in your life so just just starting to notice how different foods affect your energy levels or Mm even affecting your hunger so if you have something does it keep you feeling full for a long time versus does it kind of keep you feeling full for half an hour and then you're hungry again yeah yeah and this doesn't even need to be some like formal thing right it's not like suddenly start journaling everything and whatever it's just a little like hmm oh okay huh I noticed that today kind of a thing exactly right yeah Yeah. cool no, that's easy. I mean, that just makes it easy. You know, I think sometimes if folks get started on a, a little bit of awareness, they get bogged down and like, oh, I must do X, Y, Z and I must do it on time. And I, I didn't. And then suddenly like, boom, we're off track and we gave up and it didn't work and all of that. And it's like, no, it's just a little bit of being present, I guess, really. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think, um, certain personality types are probably more predisposed to that like if I'm going to do something I have to be a hundred percent and I have to do it exactly right yeah. there is no exactly right with this like it's sure. it's just about learning your body and, and figuring out what what your body needs yeah no that's that's great and I and since this is a, a community minded thing too, I mean, we've talked about the cultural side of it and, and now like a little bit of a personal first step that writers can take. Like if I'm a if I'm a, a writer out there in the community and how can I help out, you know, and support my fellow writers with also maybe starting to shift a little of this culture? I mean Yeah. Yeah, I'm so glad you asked that question because I think there's so much that we can do as a community to break down this idea that you have to look a certain way to be a good writer. Um, The first thing I think we need to do better at is supporting brands that make clothes that fit all body types. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Just speaking with some writers more recently um, for people who, who are in bigger bodies, and I say living in bigger bodies rather than using um other terms like overweight or obese because those are actually quite stigmatizing right words and language um yeah speaking speaking to some of those writers um it is really clear that if they can't easily find clothes that fit them and and that they feel comfortable in and that they look good in it's almost like this signpost that you don't belong here Uh, and I I just feel so strongly that this sport is better when we all belong when there is that diversity yeah here (laughs) here for sure for sure like why should um our clothing choices shut us out that seems like that's about one of the most superficial things that there could possibly be like that doesn't represent a a person or who they are inside um yeah I mean I don't care go ride around in a burlap bag for all I care like exactly that floats your boat more power to you man so yeah yeah no I think that's that's great was there anything else you wanted to add to that 
I, I think probably the other thing is um, like not kind of commenting on what's on someone else's plate unless it's to say, oh, that looks really yummy. Mm. Um, like often you'll sort of get comments about, oh, you're being so healthy or um, those sorts of things can be really damaging and, and shame inducing, even if you think you're saying something positive. And I think that is true also for commenting on people's weight or bodies, you know, mm -hmm. often people think they're being helpful by commenting if they think someone's lost weight, but that can actually, like, you don't actually know what's going on for that person. You know, maybe they've been sick or maybe they're going through a really stressful time and that's what's caused them to lose weight. So, you know, find another way to compliment someone. Um, there's so many other things like, oh, wow, you look so healthy or, mm -hmm. um, hey, thanks so much for, for calling my test for me or mm -hmm. helping me walk that line on my course or bringing my horse in for the fit from the field. Like we just don't need to be commenting on other people's bodies. Yeah. No, oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yeah. Very, very powerful. Like, um, oh, that's a good one. I, I'm just thinking of all the the other things to say now I can yeah nice long list of wonderful uplifting phrases and yeah. you don't have to get into other people's stuff yeah exactly yeah and I think <laughs> that um you know when we can find those other things to to compliment someone on or thank them about like it it's actually a lot more meaningful and mm -hmm. empowering yeah yeah Definitely. Well, I mean, and even just in, in general, um, just even making a compliment can sometimes be a judgment, you know, and trying to just move away from judgment period into just saying, thank you. Like I've, I've tried been, this is something new I've kind of been working on just for my personal journey lately of just the, the, the act of thanking people which I've always done but do that rather than just like an observation or a compliment or something like that and that that even I think is way more powerful um, yeah so yeah instead of you know even just oh hey you look lovely today it's just oh thank you for coming and seeing me it's so great to see you and you just sort of yeah. zip right to really the heart of the matter which is your joy with whatever is happening in that relationship between you and that person, you know, oh, your, barn mate, your trainer, whatever, you know, of just like, I think that's sort of the heart of the matter. Yeah. Um, yep. That bond. So, oh, this is so cool. This is so cool. I'm so glad we're having this conversation. Um, yeah, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be helpful. There will be all the little nuggets that people can pull from this, that our fellow writers can pull from this and, and use and fashion and learn from and keep coming back for more. Um, this is amazing. And, oh, does someone want to play? <laughs> You've got yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to like get the puppy away. <laughs> I'm talking um, and working here. Go play with your toy. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Too oh, funny. Too funny. So, so much good stuff to unpack here. So what is uh, like next steps here? Like if people would like to chit chat with you some more, how can they get in touch? Yeah. So um, I would love to connect with people on my Instagram account, which is at eq.athlete um on facebook i am the equestrian athlete um or they can find my website which is eqathlete.com perfect perfect i'll be sure to get those up for people to see with the the podcast too good stuff um awesome so and what else is coming down the pipe for you anything cool on the in the future plans like yeah, I, I suppose um, finishing my study is kind yeah, of Yeah, right. Place. That's a big one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and then just working. I've got a few little ideas that I am working on for the business. Um, I'd love to be able to do some online cooking classes. Ooh. And yeah. Um, 
and I'm also trying to put together an online course. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Hopefully, yeah. Hopefully those things will be ready to go um, before the end of the year. <laughs> I um, hear you. Yes, the small business fun of um, juggle yeah. those balls. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Trying not to overload myself yeah. um, too much, so I've still got time to ride and um, you know have a life. Yeah, right. Absolutely. No, this is so great. I mean, I'm excited to see where all this is going. I mean, it's still young days for you with um this new uh venture even though you've been in the field but like now with your yeah. own business and and seeing there's so many places you could go with it and I'm just really looking forward to I mean it's going to be wonderful I know that already but I'm oh, really excited you. for you really, yeah, really excited no. for you so Oh, well, cool. So I think we're going to be wrapping up here for today. So like we mentioned, I'm going to be posting some awesome links where you guys can all get in touch with Andrea. And it's going to be some amazing resources on her website. Follow her on Instagram and Facebook. She's got some really cool posts uh, and, and an amazing sense of humor, I must say, in those posts as well. You will have a good laugh as well as get an education. <laughs> So thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. So I loved having you on. This was so fun. So thank you for being with me here today. Thank you so much for having me, Teal. All right. Thank um, you. Absolutely loving the podcast so far. Awesome. Well, thank you. Talk soon. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you for listening to this entire podcast. If you're the kind of equestrian that likes to help others, then share this with your friends, fellow riders, and barn mates. You know, if you found value, they will too. So please share on your social media channels. Also, if you've got questions or have a topic you'd like to hear about, I'm here to help. You can email me at customerservice at sterling-essentials.com and I may even use your ID on a future podcast episode. Also, if you'd like additional empowering content, connect with me on Instagram at Empowered Equestrian Podcast. Finally, I do have a personal request. If you would, please leave a review wherever you listen. And a good one, by the way. I'd be really grateful. And through your assistance together, we can help our equestrian community thrive. Thank you and take care.